four million years later. Hi, and thanks for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, a show where two old friends get together and watch an episode of the Transformers Generation 1 cartoon in story order, and then convene to talk about what they saw. We are lifelong friends, friends for over 25 years, and lifelong fans of the cartoon series for, well, gosh, well over 25 years. We loved it as children, we loved it as teenagers, we loved it as young adults, and we are continuing to love this cartoon series well into our not so young adulthood and the window that we always look through when we review each of these episodes is how do we engage with it as grown-ups and how did we encounter it as children my name is jersey drozd i am a cartoonist and teaching artist and the other host is hoover point one <laughs> so hey just hoover because there's no there's no title this time no, there's no title this time. Why is there no title this time? Because we're not hmm. talking about an episode this time. Breaking the format. What we're doing on this special episode is talking about all the Autobot characters so far and their little fleshy friends. Why? Because we're about to jump into the point in season two where new people start appearing rapid fire. So... We're going to touch on all these characters we've seen so far. There's 24 Autobots and four squishy human (laughs) allies. So we're going to talk about them and basically go into what we like about them. Did we have the toy as a kid? You know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to sort of give these guys a bit of a send off because some of them are going to be relegated to background appearances from here on out. Ah, uh, what a drag. So yes, episode 27, by our reckoning, in the story order that Hoover very painstakingly put together, marks the end of basically the season one. Cast. Yeah, cast. An overall scenario where they're largely just like a group of stranded people on Earth, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, we had a space bridge, but there isn't a whole lot of commerce going back and forth between Cybertron and Earth. Things are about to change as we head into the second half of season two. So, yes, I think I think your your instincts are absolutely spot on that we should take one last look at all the characters we've been spending so much time with over the last several months. So, do you want to kick us off? You you wrote the order of the of the characters for us to proceed through. So, I'll follow your lead, pal. Okie dokie. First, we're gonna deal with the mini bots, those little mini cars that you could get in 1984. There were mm. six of them. And let's start it off with Braun. I'll get the door! Did you have the Braun toy? I did not. My little brother did. My little brother loved Braun a lot. I think Braun was his favorite character. And he had him. I The moment I got my hands on the toy, I was like, oh, cool, it's that egg-headed guy, because I didn't know his name yet. <laughs> and then I opened the doors to transform into robot mode, and I went, what is going on with this dude's <laughs> arms? <laughs> It's not the greatest toy in the world for sure, but character wise, he is fantastic. I did have him, you know, it's like back then we had very different expectations for robot toys, (laughs) you know, as long as we recognized it as like, oh, this is that guy on the show, you know, it's like, that was, that was, that's, that was all we could ask for back then. (laughs) If if we could squint and he vaguely looked like the guy on the show, you know, we were doing okay. Yeah, yeah. I think when we get to some of these other characters, like, like, well, we won't spend a lot of time on Bumblebee, but it's like you do notice that Bumblebee's face on the toy is way different than it is in the show. And mm-hmm. his face is like sort of like glued onto a flat platform that just folds <laughs> on the back of the car. And I remember as a child, I'd be like, yeah, it doesn't look like him. Eh, oh, well. <laughs> 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 yeah, and things sure did change. And I want to say, that did, not to dwell on it too long, but like 1996 is where everything changed, right? Like when mm. Beast Wars Transmetals came out, that'd be 97. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden yeah. it's like, wait a minute, it looks just like what I see on the screen. Oh my <laughs> gosh, how have I been okay with what came before? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Braun was, he was a bit of a disconnect. But we spent some time in this first 27 episodes really celebrating him. And mm-hmm. I think... I was surprised at how much I like the character. I I always knew I liked him, but I I think I have a a renewed and like sort of revitalized admiration for the character after, you know, having all these discussions with you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other thoughts on Braun? He's definitely one of my favorite Autobots, especially in the season one lineup. I think he's pretty mm-hmm. great. And thankfully, he gets at least one more episode to really shine coming up pretty soon. Oh, yeah. So we haven't seen the last of him, but he's not going to be around quite as much. I'm going to take it upon myself to try to do a one-sentence summary of of each of these characters to close them out. And with (laughs) Braun, it'd be, here's my plan. We go up to him. Behind him. Yeah, and we hit him like a lot. <laughs> That's broad. <laughs> okay, and now let's move on to Huffer. He's doomed. I know it. I can feel it in my data bank. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Who? I'm surprised at how little he's been in this cartoon so far. <laughs> Over the years I've known you, we have made so much hay out of making fun mm-hmm. of that poor guy. Uh, yep. Really, just, and it, we both love John Stevenson's voice acting a lot, mm-hmm. but man, Huffer, oh, what a whiner. I mean, I I love him for being a whiner, and, you know, I, I, any, any Autobot who can stand out in the crowd, I will appreciate. You uh-huh. know, if they're not just sort of generically heroic, and, you know, Sunbow does a good job at making everybody a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Huffer is definitely in that list as far as standing out. I did have the toy. And it's also a kind of lame toy because of his arms, but you know, mm-hmm. it's not horrible. You, like I said, if you can tell which character on the cartoon it is, they did okay. So, and actually, Huffer is a character that I would point to to say, like, I love the color scheme. I absolutely mm. like. It's so like you could put that orange and that purple and silver together, and you're like, yep. You could just like draw them in blobs on a, on a piece of paper, and like that's Huffer. <laughs> you very instantly identify his color scheme, which is not as easy with Autobots sometimes, right? Like a lot of Autobots are combinations of red, blue, and silver. Mm-hmm. Um, but not Huffer. Huffer stands out. He's got very unique paint scheme. Let's see. Can we sum him up? I don't want to. That's Huffer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like of all the mini bots, he and Gears sort of made the least appearances. Mm. I think we will see them a couple more times at least in the background and such. Probably hear from them a few more times as well. Mm -hmm. But we shall see. So moving on to Wind Charger. Speaking of friends, let's go back to headquarters and rustle up a few more. We've got something big on our hands. Mm. Wind Charger was my very first Transformer. Mm. And my brother, my little brother got Bumblebee, who was the red Bumblebee, and we traded because I was like, I want Bumblebee. And he's mm-hmm. like, well, I want the cool sports car. I'm like, you can have it. I, I was not, I liked things like Knight Rider and stuff. I liked, and, and Dukes of Hazard. I thought they were fine. But man, the moment I met Bumblebee, I was like, I'm, I'm all in. Even before the cartoon, right? It's like, he's, he's just so darn cute. So, so yeah, uh, Wind Charger, general contractor, becomes warrior in the Cybertron army. Like, I imagine he and Braun do a lot of hanging out at the tavern after work. <laughs> and really, like, you don't talk about work. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how I think of Wind Charger. I, I love the character. I love that he is the, 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 the gravelly voiced sort of like you know blue collar worker slash warrior there's not and we've talked about this before is like in a lot of later iterations of transformers the sports cars all tend to be young dudes with kind of higher octave voices right Mm -hmm. the justin bieber kind of good looking boy kind of characters and it was i I think there's a, a lovely incongruity with having a sleek sports car who transforms into a guy who sounds like you know you you hire him to shore up some support beams on your house Yeah, I did have the toy. I had all the mini bots. Spoiler alert. I like him working in conjunction with Braun. They've shown that a couple times now. So that's cool. He doesn't really get a whole lot of time to shine on his own. Mm -hmm. But mainly when he does, it's mainly because of his magnetic powers (laughs) that he uses. Yeah. You know, he, he could have used a little bit more screen time and characterization, but I didn't dislike what we got, and he was a fairly likable guy. I would absolutely read a miniseries of just Brawn and Windcharger Adventures. (laughs) The two of of them getting into trouble for six issues. I would totally read that comic. (laughs) So moving on to Gears. Hey, if you guys don't give me my circuit back, I'm going to start kicking Transistor. 
Gears, Mr. <laughs> Complainer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my my lumbago. Oh, my <laughs> sciatica. You know, he's, the the guy who always has an ailment to, to grumble about. So he's different than Huffer. Huffer has a different flavor. It's like, I don't want to. And Gears is like, I guess I gotta. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like the idea of a very grumpy hero. You know, not every hero can be like, you know, the tick and just be mm-hmm. so glad to be doing what he's doing. Mm-hmm. It's nice to have that sort of diversity in your lineup. And I think that's probably why they didn't use Gears a lot, maybe because, you know, they want heroes to be heroic. But having that option, having that character who's who's not going to necessarily be cheering every time the good guys win that's pretty Mm -hmm. cool and he's the character that we talked about before where i have like this non-academic sort of chart of different types of heroes that i use in my classrooms and i call this the stinker character and the stinker character is the one who is an absolute drag to have around the house when when there's no battles (laughs) but you absolutely love having them on your team when there's a battle Right. And we made the comparison Guy Gardner on the Justice League International comic series Mm -hmm. was this character. Right. Yeah. For heaven's sakes, don't let him do the laundry. But (laughs) if Despero is coming and he's going to destroy the earth, yeah, sick this guy on him. Now, Gears isn't necessarily a powerhouse that way, but because he's so gruff and because he's like, you know, so no nonsense about it, you know, he's just going to walk right into it. He's going to complain the whole time, but he's going to walk right into the, the problem. Yeah. I did have the toy as a kid. I believe he was my first mini bot, if not my first Transformer. Pretty sure he was. I remember was. you saying that. I remember yeah. you saying he was your first Transformer, yeah. And he's a fairly decent looking, fairly well resembles his animation model, mm-hmm. except for lack of details on the face, of course. But uh, that was and pretty it, typical back then. I had the toy to, or at least one of my siblings did, or we did one of those like trades that we've talked about in the show before, mm-hmm. where I trade with schoolmates. And I just remember like thinking he was an especially mysterious looking toy. Like his face mm. looks like, like Braun looks like sort of impassive or, or, or uh, like neutral. Whereas Gears looks just a little bit aggressive. Like he has that Maximilian face from the black hole kind of thing going on mm. with the visor. Yeah. And so he always seemed like a little bit more mysterious looking than any of the other mini bots. And this again is before I had a whole lot of familiarity with the TV show and then learned that nope, he's just like a little, a little grumpy sweetheart. <laughs> so moving on to cliff jumper try and remember which side you're on mirage who <laughs> you've had a lot of fun with for the past 27 episodes <laughs> all because he had the bad luck to aim at megatron and miss in the very first episode so i just took that and ran with it and, and this is this is like a flavor of our friendship. If anybody wants to know what it's been like to hang out with the two of us for the past twenty five years, is like Hoover grabs onto one little thing like that, mm-hmm. and like 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 a pit bull just does not let go. Like let it go. <laughs> it's not funny. Or <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, he missed Megatron. I'm gonna keep on going with it. <laughs> so because of that one scene, I've surmised that he needs glasses. Doesn't want to get glasses. <laughs> We've talked about this, I bet. Like doing like an Arthur's Eyes story with <laughs> Cliff Jumper. He yeah. goes back to the base and everybody laughs. He's got these big glasses. Oh. <laughs> but he does have a cool portrayal. I, I love hearing, you know, an excited Casey Kasem. Yeah. You know, that's great to hear. His toy was fairly darn accurate, probably the most accurate of the original mini bots. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I also have an affinity for the little eager dude who gets in way over his head all the time. This is the Ben Dixon character from Robotech, right? Mm. Watch this. I'm going to be awesome. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun character for me, partially because I was such a timid boy about doing physical things. So whenever I saw somebody like leap in and do something physical and whether they pass or fail, it was the courage that I always found like really, really compelling and, and like mysterious. Like, how do I get my head into that headspace? There's a kid in my, he was in my fifth grade class, and he literally climbed to the top of the slide and the playground, right? And the slide, <laughs> everybody knows what a slide is, right? Back then, it was made out of weapons grade metal, and it was about, I want to say, like 15 feet to the top, 12 feet to the top, something like that. And it just was like a, gi- a giant sheet of metal that just went straight down, didn't have the windy plastic thing. 
Kid cr- climbs to the top, jumps off the top, off the side, doesn't go down the slide. He like literally just leaps, <laughs> o- he vaults over the, the safety bars, lands on the ground, kind of spills out, hurts himself a little bit, but gets up and laughs. And I was like, whoa. Like to, to me, that was like, that was a picture of courage. It was, it was actually stupidity, but it looked like <laughs> courage to my little 11 year old brain. And I think of Cliff Jumper, like, I think that's the kind of character he is. Like he's, I wouldn't necessarily pin a medal of valor on him. But I admire the fact that he is so impulsively courageous. Mm. Yeah, I did have the toy, and I think he's a fun character to have in the show, him being so willing to jump into battle and all that. And he Mm. will show up a few more times at least, and he's definitely in the movie, so... Oh, yeah. We are not saying goodbye to him just yet. That's good. Bumblebee? Ready to roll home, guys! Bumblebee, the last of the minibots. Insert jerseys, quotes from the past 25, 26, 27 episodes here. (laughs) We all know how I feel about Bumblebee. What about you? Well, of course I like him. He's meant to be likable. I mean, he's portrayed as the character that everyone should like, especially younger viewers. So it's cool to have him around. Again, any Autobot that can stand out in the crowd, and he's just sort of the nicest the mm, what what other adjectives would you use for bumblebee he's he's the physically weakest mm-hmm. and because of that he has to be the most clever and the most brave he has the most to overcome in order to succeed in the yeah, series because he's one of the smallest but his smallness doesn't stop him from being heroic and wanting to leap into battle and he's pointed out on a couple of different occasions that that smallness is what gives him an advantage in certain situations until Thundercracker and Skywarp run into him in the caves of Burma and then it's over like in a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I had him. One thing I do want to touch on is I never had the yellow cliff jumper or the red bumblebee just because I mm. didn't understand them. I thought it was like a factory mess up and I was mm. just like, well, I don't want those. They're not on the show. Yeah. Never had those. And Never really regretted not having them, but Hmm. very likable character. He is what he's meant to be. You know, you either love him or you hate him, and I like him. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. You know, even being a Decepticon fan, I'm not anti-Bumblebee or anything. Ah, he's pretty great. Okay. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, I I don't need to belabor that anymore. Everybody's heard me enough, but what about who's next on the list? Where are we going after we finish the minibots? Well, we move up to the Autobot cars, the original Autobot cars, Mm -hmm. and I thought we'd start with Wheeljack. We're nearing the bridge to Iacon, one mega mile to go. Wheeljack, hurry, 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 step right up and look at my invention. (laughs) And then I'll stay here at the base. Is there a race going on? Who cares? I got to fix Teletran 1 because I made another thing and it killed Teletran 1. What are you going to do? That's what I do. I'm Wheeljack. (laughs) I have affection for every Autobot. Let's just put that down on the table now. But Wheeljack was one where it's like, yeah, he's great. (laughs) (laughs) But if I were to say uh, the thing that I especially, especially like about Wheeljack, it's that it's, again, that incongruity of being a Formula One racing car, whatever kind of racing car he is. He's, He's something, he's high performance. You wouldn't see him on a bumpy dirt road, right? He's got sports suspension. He's meant to go fast. He's meant to be flashy. And yet, he's got the personality of Doc Brown from Back to the Future, Mm -hmm. right? And so you just wouldn't, like in modern Transformers cartoons, they just wouldn't do that. And I feel like that's something that, again, that incongruity is something that I I feel like we should celebrate. And I would put a flashlight on it to say, hey, future iterations of Transformers, this is something that, that's that's a bit of the well that nobody's gone back to. And I feel like you could Mm -hmm. go back to that again and refresh some of the later series coming out. Hmm. But did you have his toy? I got it on a trade from a schoolmate. And by the time I got my hands on it, he was pretty transformed out. (laughs) And the thing about Wheeljack and some of the other Autobot cars as well is once they've been transformed a lot, it's like it's pretty hard to get them to stay in robot mode. And so Mm. I remember it was like it was like this whole like, oh, I got Wheeljack. And then like, oh, I can't get him to stand. He just keeps (laughs) falling down. And like, okay, he's staying in car mode. (laughs) Yeah, same with my trail. I have Trailbreaker. I don't. Ha- I have a. I have a, like a half busted wheeljack, but I have Trailbreaker, and like I, he, I have to use like museum wax to hold him up in robot mode because like he just collapses after <laughs> you know you loosen him up. But did you? I did not have wheeljack. I probably only had about 
less than half of the Autobot cars uh, will deal with them individually. But mm-hmm. Luthak is someone I appreciate as a character. He's sort of like the heroic but mad scientist. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate the fact that they didn't just put all these attributes into Ratchet. You know, the mm-hmm. the doctor, you know, the doctor wasn't also the mad scientist. He had sort of like a whole separate character for that. Yeah, agreed. It seems like it would, it would have been pretty easy to have the guy who was fixing you also be the guy who came up with inventions and stuff. But I appreciate the fact that they sort of spread the traits around. So it was Wheeljack and Ratchet sitting at base a lot doing stuff. And and this goes back to that thing that we noticed in the Doug Booth episodes is that it, it's, it seems like episodes become a lot more fun when there's friendships created between the characters like Braun and Windcharger. Like the fact there were multiple episodes of the two of them are getting into trouble together. That and like, wow, mm-hmm. I, you know, it's like that's something I didn't pay a lot of attention to before, but I love it. A Spike and Bumblebee, of course, we always knew that. But like, yeah, you're right. Ratchet and Wheeljack are kind of buddies. You know, mm-hmm. and it's nice. It's nice that like there's not just one dude state. Like you look at Transformers Prime, Ratchet doesn't have any friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and partially for good reason. But also, it's like, come on, it's got to be lonely just to stay at the base all the time, just talk to everybody mm-hmm. over the radio. Yeah. So yeah, good observation. Moving on to jazz. North side of Cybertron is blacker than the inside of a drive shaft. Mm-hmm. Jazz was another figure that I did not have. Eventually, much later in life, I got the Generation 2 version. Oh. But I never had the original. Yeah. I always appreciated him as a character. You know, he had a very standout voice. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, he was very fun. You know, he was always doing things to make viewers smile. So I appreciated mm-hmm. that. How about you? Yeah, you're right. He's like the, one of the only Autobots who's playful. Mm-hmm. Right? Because even Bumblebee, Bumblebee's friendly, but I wouldn't call him playful. Right. I mean, he, but the jazz is always kind of, he's ready to goof around. And like, even in Attack of the Autobots, when Blue Streak is attacking him, he's like, hey, be careful there, buddy. You know, he's like, he's <laughs> he's keeping his cool and keeping things light, despite the fact that his friend is trying to murder him, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, and also he's one of the few Autobots you see ever, like just having fun outside of the base, right? Like, like Hound goes to a museum with Spike. Bumblebee, yes, he goes to the arcade with Spike that one time, but... It's not uncommon to see jazz like just cruising and listening to music. Mm-hmm. So, getting speaker so, upgrades and so so forth. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's aspects to his personality that I feel are very dated, but it, and also there's that whole weirdness of like how he was interpreted in the first three episodes versus how they began to interpret him later. But I feel like that's those two weirdnesses are overshadowed by Scatman Crowther's super memorable performance and. Mm-hmm. I have yet to meet anybody in, like, when we talk about Transformers just casually amongst people who grew up with the series who don't like jazz a little bit. Like, like my wife is, like, I wouldn't call her, like, a huge Transformers fan, although my prized possession is a drawing she did at Bumblebee in 1986 that if my <laughs> house was on fire, I would run into the house to get it. <laughs> oh, I, may, I probably wouldn't because that's not safe. But anyway, I, 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 I'm speaking <laughs> metaphor. I'm speaking expressively, right? Okay. He, he's like her favorite character, right? Like like when the commemorative series came out, the 25th anniversary years ago, we're looking at the Toys R Us shelves and I'm like, well, I got to get Starscream. I got to get Optimus. And Anne's like, well, I got to get Jazz. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't feel that neat. I like Jazz and everything. But she's like, well, but she's like, it's Jazz. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> so I feel like he's like, he's definitely one of the most memorable characters in the series. And, and a lot of that I would attribute to Scatman Crothers. Um, definitely, yeah. Yeah. Moving on to Hound. Ease off your throttle, Cliff Jumper. Remember what Prime said. Just find him. Hound I did not have as a kid. Never had any version of him. Well, I guess there haven't been a lot of versions of him, but I never had him. Yeah, same here. I appreciate the portrayal, though. His superpowers cool. Holograms are neat. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I like his portrayal as far as his character goes, but uh, it's, you know, it's not... It's not as loud as some of the others, but it's not intended to be either. He gave an interesting different performance compared to, like we, we talked a lot about like a lot of the, the first season Autobots have like that gravelly older guy voice. Hound has mm-hmm. an older guy voice, but it's much more, it's lighter, you know, mm-hmm. it's got a lighter texture to it. And you can, you can clearly hear the Jimmy Stewart that he's shooting for in it. Yeah. I, I didn't really have strong feelings about Hound as a kid. I liked him fine. 
Yeah, me either. I have a lot more affection for him as an adult, especially as an adult who's getting a little bit older, who does mentoring with young people. And I'm like, yeah, I can I can feel that tone of voice creeping into, into me when I'm talking to kids, you know? <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> Never been to a museum. <laughs> So Hound is, uh, he's, he's pretty great. I, but uh, he, he was a toy that I wanted when I was a kid because I thought like army jeeps just looked cool. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, that's another thing like I think is worth noting is like, it's funny how like I, I look back on the series and I really get nostalgic for how all the Autobots turned into cars that were around at the time. And mm -hmm. now they don't do that nearly as much. But yet I think both of us were like super into military vehicles when we were little boys, right? Yeah. So like there was part of me who really wanted Hound just because he was a cool military Jeep. But yeah, never never came across my radar. Nobody ever had Hound to trade with at school. And, you know, I didn't get to go to Toys R Us like you did when I was a kid. So just <laughs> never got him. Well, moving on to Trailbreaker. Try and take it, mega turkey. I did not have him ever. Mm-hmm. I don't even think I've held one or seen anybody who had it in my presence. Wow. I, you know, I don't know why, but in my teen years, I became fascinated by Trailbreaker. And I think it's for a variety of reasons. I think like one is that he looks distinct from all the other Autobots. Mm -hmm. He had the asymmetry of the one gun hand and then the one hand hand. Also, I think by the time I got into high school, I became obsessed with the idea of like, like I wanted my first car to be, what were those called? The GMC the Suburbans, those gigantic mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. like half pickup truck, half SUV. Well, actually bigger than an SUV. And like, he was the closest thing to that in the Autobots. Yeah. He, he looked like the, he would be the most fun to drive to me when I was, when I was a teenager. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of, a, I, I, I realize how silly that sounds to say now, but like it, when I was 15, I would like, I was thinking about like, okay, Bumblebee would be great, but Trailbreaker would be more fun to drive, even though <laughs> like he says, like, I'm not very fast. <laughs> <laughs> I also was like, I was really interested in the fact that like I, when I read his file card, it said like he feels, he feels like insecure about things. He doesn't feel like he's always co contributing to the Autobots or something words to that effect. And I loved watching episodes and looking for chances where that might be in there. And, th and there's only a few examples where you can look at any dialogue that points to that. And it's like, yeah, when he says I'm not built for speed, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I do have him. He was one of the first generation one cars that I bought in my twenties when I started going out to like flea markets and comic stores to like find old transformers to collect again. And like I said, the problem with him is that he largely like, imagine taking the truck and just like crack it in half. And then like mm. the body just kind of empties out of the bottom of the truck. <laughs> and so when you, when he gets really loose and floppy, it's like, it's really hard to stand him up in robot mode. So mm. he's with my generation one setup and he's got museum wax stuck in all of his joints to hold them together. <laughs> yeah. Character wise, I feel like he and probably blue streak are the Autobot cars with the least amount of screen time. Mm. So it feels like we don't, quite get to know him as well as we do characters like say sideswipe or jazz or wheeljack mm -hmm. or prowl yeah there just wasn't a lot to glom onto. yeah it was as far as i can tell it was great to hear frank welker do an autobot mm -hmm. of course he also did mirage <laughs> i don't know i can't really think of much to say about him he's just sort of there yeah he comes from the same group as like wind charger and brawn you know, like the, the, the gravelly voiced older people. And so I think that was another thing I found really attractive about him as a kid is like this idea of like, well, they're all grown ups. You know, that's how grown ups sound. You know, Sideswipe <laughs> doesn't sound like a grown up. Sideswipe sounds like my older brother, mm -hmm. you know, but Trailbreaker sounds like a grown up. And the thing about grown ups is they know what choices to make. And I can't wait until I'm a grown up <laughs> and I'll know exactly what to do all the time. Like Trailbreaker. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on to Sideswipe. Gee, <laughs> I didn't know Decepticons had uncles. Mm -hmm. I did have his toy because I loved Lamborghinis when I was that age. So <laughs> for them to do a Lamborghini Transformer, that was that was a obvious must buy. It's so funny how like that time and like that period, you could really just define it by saying like, okay, Lamborghinis, dinosaurs. You know, fluorescent uh, colors. <laughs> fluorescent well, I guess colors. that was kind of maybe more late eighties, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. But like, Ann and I have this ongoing conversation about like movie little boys bedroom. 
and yeah. like note in noticing and then Sean Robert, our friend from Brandon in the eighties mm-hmm. would be like the source to go to on this. But like we've, we've been like tallying the kind of things you find And poster of Lambert of airbrushed Lamborghini is definitely one of the items you would find in eighties little boy movie bedroom. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is weird because I mean, I didn't, I didn't just sort of naturally love cars. Yeah. Yeah, that is surprising. Knowing what I know about you, like you were not like like a super Hot Wheels kid or anything. Mm-mm, no, I mean I I did have my Hot Wheels phase as a kid, but as far as like just looking at cars and going, wow, I want this car. You know, that never happened until I would say like the over merchandising of Lamborghinis in the mid '80s. So that was kind of strange. I don't know what about it exactly made me glom onto that, but I even had like a Lamborghini poster on the wall, like your typical (laughs) kid in a movie. And it looked just like Sideswipe, same model and everything. Oh my gosh. Oh, and Kevin from the Wonder Years was in the bed right next to you, getting read (laughs) a book by his grandpa. You know what? What's funny is is that I had the opposite reaction. I, I really was not a fan of... The, the car or those two characters, it, like, especially. Like, I, I thought they were fine. I think it was another one of those things where it's like, if they seem to be too much like me, like too young, too mm. um, irresponsible, I, I, I wasn't as interested in that character. So, like, Sunstreak and Sideswipe were characters as a child. I was like, eh, they're fine. And as I got to be in my 20s and into my young adulthood, I started to appreciate that kind of character a lot more. And now I adore them. I adore that they're, they're brothers. I love that idea of mm-hmm. two robots. I think as a kid, too, that was another one. I was like, how could they be brothers? They're robots. You know, it's like, well, but it's fantasy. They look like people. They shouldn't look like people. <laughs> anyway, I love it now. And I, but I still don't have any special affinity for like Lamborghinis or any kind of sports car in general. But I love the dynamic of the, the I, I love the jet judo scene. It's one of my favorite scenes in all Transformers history, and I wish we would have gotten more of that with them. As far as the portrayal of Sideswipe, I really like his Michael Bell voice. You know, Michael Bell is just a very likable voice artist. You know, you hear that voice and you're like, oh, it's Michael Bell. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he really does. Yeah, his voice is very comforting. I mean, even if he's doing like a scary voice, there's something about it that just like Rob Paulson, I think, has a similar kind of voice. Mm, yeah so pretty pretty fun character you know he's always much like jazz he's you know he's always trying to do things in a fun way Mm -hmm. but but yeah he actually unlike jazz he's a little bit more excited about the the prospect of fighting jazz Mm -hmm. shows up to fight like well i'm gonna i guess we're doing this he doesn't complain (laughs) about it but he doesn't like relish it the way sideswipe is like oh we're gonna beat up megatron let's jump into megatron so then we get to his brother, Sunstreaker. Okay, guys, line up one next to the other. Yep. I eventually got this toy when it was available as a mail order, but I would always try mm. to find him in the beginning. And I think I, you know, whenever I had money to spend on Transformers, he was just never found in the shops. But once they had him available through mail order, I was like, oh, I can finally get Sunstreaker. Can so. we can we just take a second to talk about the mail order thing? Because like this is mm. this is one of those things that like it's it's kind of like a fundamental memory of my childhood that when I look back and look at the time frame, it feels like this was a blip in the radar of my life, but it felt like so like such a profound like turning point. <laughs> in that when the toys came out, they would be out for like a year or whatever maybe two years, and then they would go away. They'd like to be replaced by the new toys. And then Hasbro would offer these little order forms with some of the new toys to order some of the old toys from mm-hmm. the previous season. Now, the G.I. Joe did this and Transformers did this. Yep. I don't remember if any of the other lines did this. But I remember ordering like old Cobras from <laughs> Hasbro. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, this is my chance to get Scrap Iron. I can finally get Scrap Iron, or whoever it was. I forget exactly which figure it was. But it felt like I was reaching back into the depths of time to, to, to right a wrong that this toy never was on my shelf, right? And when it came in the mail, because like also, like I, I don't know... Not to get too uphill both ways, barefoot in the snow, but you know, in in growing up in a rural area where I did, mail was kind of a big deal. Like when the mail truck came, like something cool was about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and and when it was a box that said and it said Master Jersey Drozd, I was like Master, you know, just like in the Christmas story. They actually still used that in our childhood. 
and I open it up and like there's there's the toy and it's not on the card. It's just like in a shrink wrap thing or whatever. But like something about that felt immensely awesome that you could still get old, like quote unquote old stuff. But like you look back, it's like that was a year ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was eleven, so like pers- perspective, it was a tenth of my life, right? So it felt like a, m- a much more grandiose chasm that I was reaching across. <laughs> It's it's neat that they chose to do he and Sideswipe as brothers. I don't know mm-hmm. if it just was because they were both Lamborghinis or, you know, I don't know what the idea behind that was, but it was sort of a unusual idea. I mean, these, these guys are robots, you know, mm-hmm. we don't necessarily need any kind of family relations, but, you know, they chose to do that. I think it's kind of neat and inventive. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like, you know, he has a buddy for doing stuff with just like, you know, Windcharger and Brawn and Ratchet and Wheeljack. I don't know if they were intentionally setting up duos or what their reasoning behind that was, but worked out pretty neat. Yeah. Well, as somebody with uh, dozens and dozens of siblings, I had <laughs> I had my my brother who's immediately younger than me when we were little kids. We were often mistaken as twins. We looked so much mm. alike, and sometimes that would really annoy me. But a lot of times it didn't matter because we were thick as thieves, and we were like I have to tell you, it was cool having a built-in buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't have to go make a friend. He's here. <laughs> He's here all the time, <laughs> and he drives me up a wall. And sometimes we get the fights about things, but ultimately I've got this little buddy who's always there for me. <laughs> and I'm surprised in retrospect that I didn't like Sunstreaker and Sideswipe more. You know, mm. as a child. Maybe it was just too close to home. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. But yeah, they they didn't connect with me the way some of the other characters did. Well, now we move on to Mirage. (laughs) Sorry, Prime. The ship was full. (laughs) Oh, Mirage. For so long, that voice confused me until I heard, I think it was Corey Burton saying that it was Frank Walker's impersonation of Gregory Peck. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> now I get it. But like my entire childhood, my early 20s, I was like, why does he talk like that? <laughs> <laughs> Mirage, another character that as a toy, I didn't, I didn't care anything about getting the toy. I'm like, I don't know, it's like a race car, you know, not super into like Formula One or whatever race car he is. Mm-hmm. Like the character on the show, I thought he was cool. I thought his power looked really neat. Outside of the traitor, does he do that? Well, he, he has those couple moments where he, <laughs> he like... just turns invisible whenever it's convenient. <laughs> yeah, whenever they need someone to turn invisible, <laughs> there's Mirage. Yeah, and I think I think as a child, I read him as just like a sleepy character. He didn't like he didn't say or do anything that was like really loud and bombastic like some of the other characters. Mm-hmm. He didn't smash through a wall like Braun. But yeah, what's what's Mirage's story mirage is the character who just doesn't draw a lot of attention to himself which is appropriate given that he has <laughs> powers to turn invisible you know he does his business in the background the traitor it's all about him doing something in the background the end of the first miniseries he's doing something in the background the end of ultimate doom he's doing something in the background yep he's a guy who doesn't look for a lot of credit for what he's doing he's just a really really good team player yeah and he and Sideswipe were my first Autobot cars. And for the longest time, until I got some trades worked out with other kids, they were my only two Autobot cars. Eventually, wow. eventually I got Sunstreaker through mail order and had both Prowl and Blue Streak. Let me just spoil that right away. <laughs> got through trades, but didn't have a whole lot of Autobot cars to begin with. Kind of strange. Hmm. As far as his character goes, it's again, it's nice to have an Autobot that can stand out and portrayed as there's a bit of a question whether he's super loyal to the cause. He's always kind of on his own. He, Mm. of all the Autobots, definitely does not really have a buddy. And, you know, as we've seen in the story, you know, that sort of comes back to bite him because Cliffjumper begins to think he's a traitor. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But maybe he's just a loner. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He's a very likable character, very interesting. And again, it's always nice to hear Frank Welker do a unusual kind of voice. Mm-hmm. But now we move on to Ironhide. Well, I'm tired of sucking their vapor trail. I'll stop them. Who I had a very deep affection for from day one. I loved Ironhide, always loved Ironhide. 
Yeah, and again, I think as a child, it was I was very attracted to the fact that they kind of made a point out of that he's an older Autobot. He's like an older, more run down, but he's still very committed and very loyal and very brave. And like he jumps in front of laser fire to protect Optimus, you know? Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, like my my favorite characters in a lot of fiction were always like the really supportive buddy. You know, like I loved, mm. I loved Kermit the Frog. Fine, Fozzie Bear, way better. He's a very, very <laughs> loyal friend, and he's so vulnerable. He'll do anything for his friend Kermit. You know, like that, like that kind of character always like really transmitted something to me. And I think I was getting that from Ironhide as a child. And I did get the toy in a trade, and I went, <laughs> "All right, Ironhide!" And then I transformed and went, "Oh, oh what, what, <laughs> what's going on? Is is he not done? Is there parts missing? Like, he, where's his head? Where's his head? There's no head." <laughs> What's that face sticker? <laughs> yeah, it literally, like, I, I, I sat on the porch of my house with my brother, puzzling and puzzling over it. Like, what, he's not done. Like, there must be, there's, there must be pieces, like, these pieces that open up, like, in the back. They must go someplace on him. He's like, no, I think it's done. Because <laughs> we didn't have the box. We didn't have the instructions. So it was, it was definitely a moment where I was like, yay, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know if we should describe the toy for anybody who's listening who didn't grow up with the toys. Uh, just Google it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It defies description. You just need to Google it. Yeah. Uh, I did not have him or Ratchet, so I I think that was probably intentional because they looked so weird and dumb. I was like, no, I'm not getting this. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you saw them in the store and saw the package art and were like, no. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. not them. I, I I didn't have that. I didn't know what they looked like in the toys until I actually got my hands on them. So that, <laughs> that one by, by passed me by. <laughs> Although I would imagine I would have come across it in the Sears catalog, which is something we haven't talked about, I don't think, a whole lot in the show. <laughs> but maybe in a future sort of mid-season or post-season wrap-up, we can talk about the importance of those holiday catalogs when we were growing up. But <laughs> Well, definitely a fantastic character, mm -hmm. you know, super lovable. Mm -hmm. uh, that with that Peter Cullen zesty southerner voice. Mm -hmm. oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So now moving on to Ratchet. Put your axle up and rest a while, Mirage. I'll look in on you later. Again, I did not have his toy. Did not want his toy based on how <laughs> it looked. <laughs> <laughs> Fun character. A little grumpy, but, you know, not Gears level of grumpiness. Yeah. He's the one who gets all the stuff done back at base. I like him. I don't have a lot of super duper affection for him, but he's he's likable. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Autobot lover? I think your, your assessment is right. He's like just mildly grumpy. When they make jokes with Ratchet, it's usually because he's complaining about something. Gruff, no nonsense, which is like kind of antithetical to what his foul card said, where it's like he's a party animal and a tool and die man, whatever. <laughs> like, because like in the comics, they made a point of like, I love parties, and uh, at least in the first like 15 issues or so, where it was like really focused on Ratchet. And I was like, as a kid, I'm like, why are we still following Ratchet around? <laughs> you know, but we've had that discussion elsewhere. But go back to our season one wrap up two parter. I think it was one of those things that where as a child I was not as interested because it's like, well, he's, he's, a, he's a medic, you know, he's an ambulance. So that doesn't really do anything cool. But as I got older, I had a lot more, uh, older, I mean like teens, I had a lot more interest and affection for the type of character that he is. Mm -hmm. He, I, I understood what his function was, not function in terms of within the, the story context, but in terms of like function as like a character in a cast, right? Mm-hmm. Dependable, reliable, very no nonsense. Doesn't need to draw a lot of attention to himself. He's just he's there to say, "Stand back, kid. I've got work to do." <laughs> very parental that way, like the way parents look in your life when you're young, right? Not, I wouldn't put him in like a top ten characters, but I I appreciate what he's there for. Babadiansky did do a good job of creating a rounded group of people to all sort of support and bounce off one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's interesting that they chose to have Wheeljack be buddies with. Ratchet, given that Wheeljack is, like you said, mad scientist, kind of weird, kind of goofy, and then you have his no not I guess they're like the the, the Mythbusters, right? Like like mm. one of them is the outgoing guy, and one of them is the more taciturn, you know, quiet guy, and then <laughs> they make stuff that blows up. Interesting comparison. <laughs> so moving on to Blue Streak. Hang on, Ironhide! I mean, hold tight! 
Again, he was a toy I only got through trading my neighbor. Mm-hmm. And I think he was broken. There was a tab <laughs> like that was connecting his like head and neck to the windshield of the car. Yeah. On yeah. Prowl, Blue Streak, and Smokescreen that would just get broken all the time. I yeah. think they were broken when I got him. Again, another Casey Kasem character who I don't know if maybe he didn't get a lot of play because Cliff Jumper was getting a lot of play and maybe they chose to, you know, hold one of them back, but you know, always enjoyable when he shows up, mm-hmm. but just doesn't show up a whole lot. What I think is interesting about Blue Streak is it, Casey Kasem's performance in particular is that he sounds younger than Cliff Jumper. Mm. Which, you know, it's like you could easily, this is one of the things that I love about the Generation 1 series in particular is, is the importance of the mini bots. And we've kind of speculated on this, like maybe this is their way of saying like, hey, look, a lot of kids are only going to get the mini bots because they don't have $15 to throw on a car. So let's make sure the mini bots all have something really specific to contribute to the to the team. Mm-hmm. And and I wonder how much of that thought went into the, the television production because like Cliff Jumper seems like the more capable, more mature version of Blue Streak. Mm, so Blue Streak yeah. he Blue Streak seems kind of like he's he's sounds seems even younger than Sideswipe to me. Or maybe not younger than Sideswipe. He's the Autobot who's maybe two years older than Sideswipe who lived at home instead of going to college. <laughs> He took a couple years off and then he never went, you know? And so he's got kind of like that, that, you know, big Lebowski kind of thing about him, but he's still got a, like a, like a lot of youthful zeal to him too. But he just seems like he's kind of, he's kind of all over the place, right? Yeah. I will say I never had the toy, never even saw the toy, Mm. wanted it bad. Prowl and Blue Streak in particular as a kid, I thought those cars looked really cool. (laughs) (laughs) Dots and Z. I didn't give a darn about Lamborghini Countach's, but man, oh man, did I, I thought those Datsuns looked amazing. <laughs> and yeah, I, I specifically coveted those two, but never got my hands on a blue streak. And you know, it's, I don't have like a lot of, there's not like a blue, a lot of blue streak moments in the cartoon that I go like, oh, that's what really exemplifies the character. It makes me love him. Mm-hmm. He's fun to have on there, but yeah, he, they didn't do a lot. I feel like we could come up with a list like Trailbreaker, Blue Streak, and Gosh, anybody else that we would say like, oh, missed missed opportunities to like really do more with them? Um, They're definitely at the top of the list, I would say. Yeah, yeah, they just don't they don't do a whole lot with either of them, so they're really hard to pin down and say like this is what they're all about. We can speculate based on like a lot of evidence thrown out by a variety of writers, but but Blue Streak feels like kind of like a mess to me. I, mess is a strong word. He just seems kind of chaotic compared to a lot of the other characters who really have like a very focused kind of personality. Like the next guy we're going to talk about where there's only one thing you need to know about him. <laughs> Prowl. Well, you sure had me execute a fantastic move, Chip. You think just like a regular mainframe. Prowl the military strategist. <laughs> And you're never going to forget that because just about every line he has in the show has to do with military strategy. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. He's a police car. So it's nice that he has that sort of adherence to the law and such. But maybe, I don't know, maybe the military strategist should have been Hound based yeah. on his alt mode. Yeah. Yeah. But see, this is this is that incongruity that I love about this series is that I love that Hound is a military jeep, but what's like the one unique thing about him? He loves Earth. Like he's mm. like, and like there's a, more than a handful of times where that comes up, but like they put up really they really put a lampshade on it in like the first or second episode. But like so, okay, here's the guy who really should be the military strategist, but he's like, hey Hound, you want to strategize with some military over here? No, I think I'm gonna go look at the ducks. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and he he leaves, and then like the police car, the civilian defender is like, "Well, I'll step up and I'll be the military strategist on this." I I love that. I feel like this is something that I I hope future iterations of Transformers can get something out of and bring in that kind of whimsy, because as a cartoonist and as somebody who teaches cartooning, one of the things that I teach is like how to design a character so that people can make guesses about the character. And then part of the fun is defying their expectations about the character. So Mm. yes, design somebody who makes us go like, well, that's clearly a bad guy, but no, indeed they're a good guy, you know, or, you know, you think that they're selfish and they're not selfish at all. That kind of thing. He's a police car. So obviously, well, you look at 2001 RID, right? How was Prowl portrayed in that? 
right? <laughs> and, yeah. and it's lovely. I love him. He's like super uptight, stickler for the rule book, you know? Like, so even when they, they find like a detonator at the bottom of the sea and they're like, well, that's clearly a detonator. What do you think it goes to? And Prowl's like, rule number one of the police safety book, never push a button unless you know what it's for, you know? And everybody's <laughs> like, oh, okay. Yeah, like, it's like that's moving in the other direction of leaning right into the expectation and pushing it to like Mel Brooks levels. But there's something about just like this, this whimsical sort of mix, mixing, matching and mismatching of function to vehicle form that I really, really love about this series. <laughs> so, and Prowl was a figure. I, I did get him on a temporary trade, the kind of thing where it's like, you get to borrow my guy for two weeks, I'll borrow yours. And yeah, like I remember playing with that toy and something stirred in me. I'm like, oh, I got to have this guy. And you know what's <laughs> funny? I still don't have him. I still wow. don't have Prowl. Isn't that weird? I would have thought in the time of the Toys R Us reissues, like, what was that, like 15 years ago or more? Yeah. I would have thought you would have scooped up all the Autobot cars at least. No, I, I didn't. And I was being really selective about it. And I don't know why I bypassed Prowl. I might not have come across him. I might not have seen him, but and actually, no, let me check. Anne might have gotten him for me for Christmas one year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, I'm in the middle of moving into my new my new home, and like I'm slowly unpacking all this stuff that's been in boxes for years, and it's like it's it's been lovely to, re, to like be like, oh, I own this. <laughs> so it might be in there. I, don't quote me on this, but he he might have just been in storage for like the past like six years, seven years. <laughs> He's not in my shelf now. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Well, again, a, a great Michael Bell portrayal. Yeah. He's very in charge, but he's not in charge, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You know, he's very up on the goings on militarily of the Autobots, but he's not even necessarily the second in command. You know, he's just he's just there to lend his thoughts on, you know, anything military strategy. So kind of interesting. Wasn't his foul card logic is the ultimate weapon? Yeah, I think so. Like his his slogan, I should say. And he feels like they are definitely not pointing directly towards Mr. Spock from the original Star Trek, but he feels like he's filling a similar kind of role. Mm, where he, yeah. He sees and hears everything. He doesn't offer anything unless it's specifically either asked for or if it lends to understanding the tactical situation that they're in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, except for role for it where there's that, magical magical scene where he and chip chase work together and it will until my dying day it will remain one of my one of my golden memories of of a reality that will never be <laughs> now we move on to the dinobots mm -hmm. let's start with the king of dinobots grimlock always get autobots out of messes they get into Dinobots, smash them! Everybody loves him. In the first season, I think it's really interesting and cool that they kind of lean on the fact that he is not that committed to the cause. Mm -hmm. And he's happy to show up and wreck up the place when called upon, but he doesn't necessarily think Optimus is all that terrific. Doesn't really understand the value of protecting life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't say he's hostile toward it, but he's just like, well, you sell me on this. Why do I got to save these things? Why do I got to do this? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So he comes across as being like a little bit shiftless. I would say he's like, he's more, he's more lazy than he is hostile towards anybody. Yeah. And I got to say, I loved that as a child. I mean, the ultimate doom, when I watched that for the first time as a kid, and I remember, this is something I didn't want, is I would go to my brothers and I would be like, there's a new episode and there's these robots that turn into dinosaurs. You know, I, <laughs> like, I start like recapping the episode for them like they need to know, right? <laughs> but I remember like, I, it was the scene where Grimlock says, I don't care, the whole planet could fall apart, makes no difference to me. And then Wheeljack's like, with you on it? He's like, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> and I thought that was like most elevated, most princely comedy. <laughs> <laughs> like Johnny Carson himself wrote it. It was so good, you know. <laughs> yeah, that I, I find that super charming. I like Grimlock in the later iterations too, but season one Grimlock is a, a super special because I I like the idea of he's the biggest meanest dude in the block. He's happy to sleep in the closet until you need him, but even <laughs> if you need him, you got to make your case as to why he's going to be there, and he'll kind of complain a little bit while he's there, <laughs> <laughs> like in Atlantis Arise. Yeah, I've gone on record with my Dinobot thoughts, but 
if I had to pick a Dinobot era that I like, it's definitely this one that we've just covered, where they're the guys that the Autobots call on when there's there's big trouble. It's like mm-hmm. the Autobots have tried to do it themselves and they can't get it done. So mm-hmm. they call on Grimlock and the gang and they get it done and then they go home. <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite period of the Dinobots. Definitely Agreed. more so this than say season three. Oh, season three, like you hardly see them anymore. And then when you do, it's like they're just silly characters. Mm-hmm. Or they're more silly characters, I should say. Like in this season, in this in the first twenty seven episodes that we've talked about so far, they're they're really frightening characters. I mean, yeah. like, it, like Megatron is afraid of the Dinobots, and for good mm-hmm. reason. Yeah. So, and they've done things like shown that Grimlock can take a few blasts from Megatron's fusion cannon and just just walk it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He keeps coming. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. That that's funny. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And of course, we've already told the the harrowing tale of how I got Grimlock as a kid. So no need to revisit that. Just need to play the Incredible Hulk music underneath it just for a second. (laughs) There it is. Now we all remember how that felt. There you go. Thanks, Mom. (laughs) So let's move along to Slag. What do you think about Slag? That good enough for Slag. So we don't. It's, we don't get a whole lot out of characterization out no. of these characters. Uh, War of the Dinobots is where we really get a sense of the differences between them. And I will say, you know, to be fair to the cartoon, we learn more about the Dinobots faster than we learned about the Constructicons, which we'll talk about next week. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel like I, I like the idea of a guy who just wants to get there, get in there and mix things up. Right. Like I get the feeling with with Slag is like he's the bar buddy that you really hope won't come to the bar with you because <laughs> <laughs> like he's go- He's going to get into trouble again, you know, and it's like he- he's got like this big chip on his shoulder and he just wants to wants to mix it up with anybody. And I feel like if it would have been a fun story to see what it looks like when Slag is just at the base and there's not a battle going on. Right. Mm, yeah. Does Grimlock keep him reined in, or does he go around? I imagine Slag is a guy who goes around and antagonizes everybody else. Like, <laughs> like, like Bumblebee's sitting at a table reading the book, and Slag like flicks the book with his finger so that it closes on him, you know. And Bumblebee's like, "Stop it!" And he opens the book again, and Slag flicks the book and it closes again. It's like, "Stop it!" You know, he's like, he's just trying to get him to like get in his face so he has a reason to fight somebody. <laughs> that's that's not something I wouldn't call that a good guy, right? Mm-hmm. He's not really that great of a good guy. He's no. more of he's a he's a muscle. Yeah, he's a a bouncer. <laughs> so, what I appreciate about him visually, especially, is that in his dino mode, he's very short. Mm-hmm. He's very short and stout, and he breathes fire, and that's always a good visual. Yeah. So uh, yeah. he's basically just a short flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and because he's got those little legs, it's like he's not a maneuverable dude. So what's he mm-hmm. going to do? He's going to ram things. So yeah. like, it's like he can get a lot of momentum and then watch out. He'll knock you down. But yeah, he's not going to do like a lot of flipping or anything. He's not a no. nimble character. Mm-hmm. He's a tank, right? And character-wise, yeah. all all the rest of the Dinobots sort of bleed into each other for me. And they haven't done a, a fantastic job of keeping them distinct. But probably just because, I mean, they haven't had a lot of episodes where they get to have the limelight, especially episodes where they get to have the limelight to distinguish each other from the other Dinobots. Yeah. Yeah, there's no, there's no like, fire in the sky episode for Slag. No. You know? I'll tell you one thing I think about Slag. So I have all of the Dinobots except for Snarl for some reason. I haven't figured out why that is. So I, I like Slag. I liked him enough to like get him years later. When Beast Wars came out and they introduced the idea of Slag as, as a swear that Transformers use. It's mm-hmm. like, like a general, like just a curse that they say out loud when they don't like what something's happening. And I know they don't do that anymore because we've since found out that that's actually a swear someplace else. <laughs> so <laughs> now they say scrap, I think, in the new shows, right? Uh, which, which is, it doesn't have the same kind of ag, you know, it has mm-hmm. an ag in it. It just, it feels so guttural and visceral when you say it. And especially like when tarantulas would swear with slag, it was really <laughs> good. But like, I remember when we were in our twenties, we're like, so wait a second. So the, Grimlock's buddy, the guy in the Dinobots, his name is a swear. 
Like that's what a POS this guy is, right? It's like he, here's my friend Greg. This is this is Joey, and this is bleep. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! You really call him that? And he's like, yeah, he's he's fine with it. Because <laughs> when you when you talk with him, he really is a bleep. <laughs> And then, like, you meet him, you're like, yeah, he is. <laughs> but they've since thrown that out, so now we can't say that. And actually, I think in the later iterations, they changed his name to Slug, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's okay. Not as good. Yeah, but, so I never yeah. had him or any of the other Dinobots besides Grimlock, so. Oh. So moving on to Sludge, the big Brontosaurus. Ones with face like this. Who I had, and I've told the story of my little, like, turning a corner and watching my brother destroying him. <laughs> Not my one immediately younger than me. I think he was, like, nine years younger than me because they, they go back all the way. I think there's, like, 30 or 40 kids. You get a lot of gaps in age. Anyway, <laughs> I love Sludge. I love that he is portrayed as being this big, gentle dummy. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big fan of the kind of character who is, in the right context, they're a sweetheart. In the wrong context, they are terrifying. Mm. Uh, what's the name of that character from Goonies? The big monstrous guy. Sloth. Sloth. Yeah, I feel like he's kind of that character. Like, and you look at him this way, he's a monster. You look at him that way, and he's a sweetheart. You know, uh, No Face and Spirited Away is another example I think of. Like, when he's in the bathhouse, he tur- he literally turns into a monster that eats people. And then you get him out of there, and he's like, well, I just want to, like, crochet. <laughs> and Sludge points to that. They don't do a lot with it. You know, but all we get is Frank Walker's beautiful performance of that high, squeaky, yet gravelly voice. (laughs) You know, me not know too, you know. (laughs) Oh, it's like you just want to hug him. But then when he stomps on the ground, everything falls down. So, yeah, I like that power. He's just basically just when he walks, (laughs) he (laughs) just walks a little heavier than he normally would. He can make giant (laughs) crevices in the ground. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and he, he he doesn't, he's not, like, super fast or nimble or anything either. It's just, like, he's just standing there, and he's like, oh, are you a bad person? Oh, I don't like that, stomp on the ground. <laughs> you know, he, and you think about that, too. Like, you think about, like, little kids, like a, a, a toddler throwing a tantrum. That's the kind of stuff they do. So I feel like he easily telegraphs to that. Yeah. So, yep, a lot of affection for Sludge, too. Love that, love that dynamic of, these guys are all a little bit on the... Not so bright side, but Sludge is definitely the dimmest bulb of the yeah. team. But he's but he's also got the biggest heart. He's like, I just I just want to follow like the leader, you know. <laughs> Moving on to Swoop. Call me Swoop. You know, Swoop was definitely my favorite Dinobot, more so than Grimlock. I love Grimlock. Swoop as a child, I instantly like he stood apart because he was the thin, nimble one, and mm-hmm. he could he could fly. There weren't very many Autobots that could fly at the time. Mm-hmm. And he later gets spotlighted in season two in an episode that we haven't covered yet. So we get to see, you know, a Dinobot on their own interacting mm-hmm. outside of the other Dinobots. So that's sort of unusual. So that alone sort of gives him a little spotlight that the other Dinobots didn't necessarily get. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's a Michael Bell performance. Just more gravelly. Yeah, he. Th- th- we can say without question that outside of Grimlock, none of the Dinobots gets a lot of development, but Swoop at least gets a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And we see that Swoop is probably the smartest of the Dinobots based on the way he acts in that upcoming episode. Yeah. Still, you know, so if, if Sludge is the, the dimmest bulb, Swoop is the brightest bulb, but his bulb is still only like 40 watts compared right. to <laughs> the rest of the Autobots, right? I love that, yeah, that, that idea of he's, he's the smallest, the nimblest, and the quote-unquote smartest. And I feel like he's the most fragile, right? He's got those wings that you can easily attack. Mm-hmm. So. so that just leaves Snarl. I am Snarl. Snarl, who gets almost no character development. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there anything with Snarl coming up? I, I'm I my memory is failing me. Well, there are two different two parters about the Dinobots, so yeah. maybe in one of those we shall see. He's voiced by Hal Rail, and it definitely we got like six lines, right? So like this would be digging hard, <laughs> right? Uh, but he he definitely of all the Dinobots, he sounds the most like sort of a barbarian voice. 
right? Mm. And there's that one line that I, I do love in Heavy Metal War where he's like, you know, a slide says, I've not seen these Decepticons before. And he's like, not see again either because we dynamite them <laughs> to pieces, which is clumsy but very effective and clear in what his intent is. We never see him interact with Slag directly necessarily, but I like the idea of like those two being the heavies, right? Mm. Sludge is the big gentle giant, but these two are the heavies who are standing outside the door of the club, you know? Maybe Slag enjoys his job a little bit more than Snarl, but Snarl doesn't back down from his job because, yeah, if you need to be dynamited to pieces, well, that's what's just going to happen. That's my job. <laughs> so... But yeah, it'll be interesting to see what we see in the in the rest of season two because like right now we get almost nothing as far as like we know that he gets his maximum strength in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> what did, what did you think of the toy? Uh, well, again, I never had a lot of experience with any of the Dinobots besides Grimlock. I don't think I knew anyone who had any Dinobots other than my Grimlock toy. Wow. So I never really played with him or anything. I had a friend who had Snarl, and so I did get to play with him. And the thing that stood out to me and this is, I don't know if this is nerdy or not. Most of the Dinobots, actually all the Dinobots, the head of the dinosaur conceals the head of the robot. Mm. Not so with Snarl. Like the head of Snarl's dino mode is his knees in robot mode. And his head goes way down to the rear end, gets covered up by the tail. And I remember as a kid, like thinking like, that's cool. That feels inventive and unique. <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's counterintuitive when you, like, just like how I, we talked about before, like when an Autobot had to twist their waist to turn to car mode, I would get mm -hmm. excited because it feels like this is a more <laughs> complex transformation, <laughs> you know? Snarl's transformation felt kind of more complex than any of the other Dinobots, and so that at least stood out. Did Stega, Stega who's it? Uh, not. <laughs> I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a huge... I liked dinosaurs as much as any kid in the 80s, but I wasn't like somebody who read a lot of books about dinosaurs and followed up on it. So mm -hmm. I was more interested in them as a team and as Autobots than I was about the fact, and, and like the fact they were like these heavy duty dudes who lived in a closet and come help every once in a while. That was more interesting than the fact that they were actually dinosaurs. Yeah. Same here. I had a dinosaurs phase, but it did not overlap with my transformers phase. So it was, mm. I didn't really love the idea of them because of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was interesting, but it wasn't the, the chief selling point. So now we move on to the Air Guardian Skyfire. Something's approaching from the south. Several unusual vehicles. Earth mechanisms, perhaps. It seems the time has come for me to make the change from science to war. I like that he's in his own classification called Air Guardian because they yeah. got one. It's, it's Air Guardian <laughs> slash Uber Skyfire, <laughs> which is a joke you've made repeatedly in this first mm -hmm. season. Man, anybody that wants to know how I feel about Skyfire, just go back and listen to Fire in the Sky, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I went off on that one. I didn't, as, I didn't have the toy as a kid, did you? Eventually, but not really around the time of its release. So did you get it like at like a secondhand kind of situation, like from like a flea market or a toy store? Like I want to say store? someone had it and traded it to me, but by then I wanted it mainly for its Robotech association, mm -hmm. more so yeah. than its Transformer association. Yeah. But I, I can't remember exactly where I got it from. But I huh. think he's a fantastic character. Uh, I like the idea of the scientist drafted into the war, you know, against his will and... And again, the the incongruity of the fact that he's a scientist, but he turns into like this gigantic jumbo space plane, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, that I love that. I did not have the toy, and I had many opportunities to get it in my teens and early twenties, and I just did not care. Well, it doesn't help that he doesn't look anything like the show. Yeah, I mean, that's, this that's... isn't like a Gears or Huffer or Braun scenario. I mean, this this was the show had to make him look different legally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and but what's funny is is that like I'm a huge Robotech fan too. I mean that's that's part that's another like intellectual property that we really connected on when we first met. Mm -hmm. It was GI Joe, Transformers, Robotech, and He Man. Really, yep. So you would think that it'd be like, well, it's a Veritech, so why not have it? I mean, because I didn't have any other Veritech toys, but it was just like something about that crisscross did not register with me. I'm like, ah, eh, not interested. Mm. And yeah, the latest version, what is it? The Siege War for Cybertron mm, Jetfire. Yeah. That thing is a work of art. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and so like I I have wanted to have a proper Skyfire in my collection for so long. And when 
for those who don't know, I mean, like, it not only does it like relatively show accurate jet fire slash sky fire, but the symbol on its chest, when you press on it, it flips around so you can have an <laughs> Autobot Decepticon symbol so you can do the scene when he <laughs> says, I take no orders from you, it rips off the symbol. I forgot when I got the toy that, that it did that. Like, I, I saw the listing and saw that it did that, but then, like, the toy, I get the toy, and I'm like, oh, I wonder if it, and I push the thing, and I went, <laughs> <laughs> It was like that, like like Anne looks like, is everything okay? I'm like, yes, he just the the, the simple flips. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't I didn't have the toy, no interest in the toy until now, and now I love having it. Yeah, and I love his story. I thought, and I think we we chronicled this in later episodes after Fire in the Sky. Like I thought, like I sort of fell out of love with him as the series progressed, and he got like less of that sort of navel gazing scientist mm-hmm. personality to more of like a cheerful personality. But I just I love what they did with him after that. We only need to go back like three episodes to hear the part when you told me the sad news that we that was right. the last time we were going to see him. Yeah, and man, that I was not ready for what that did. I wasn't even ready, and I. Couldn't even call myself like a huge Skyfire fan, but he definitely deserved more than he got. Yeah. You know? yeah. Usually if he was there, he was just there because the Autobots had to go someplace far away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sadly. I mean, but what they did do with him in like, you know, Fire on the Mountain. Great. It was so good. Yeah. Yep. And that Greg Berger performance. I really like yeah. it. He thinks before he speaks, especially in his early appearances. It's like he's, you can tell he's got a lot on his mind at all times. Yeah. And then later he sort of morphs into like a, I'm just happy to be here kind of guy. Yeah. Which is fine. But his early appearances are really great. Yeah. Oh, so much affection for Skyfire. And if I were to underline it one more time, for those who haven't listened to Fire in the Sky in a long time or never listened to it, the interesting thing about him for me is he is a character who's introduced into a world where he has a function. I am a scientist. This is what I do. Mm-hmm. You are asleep for four million years. You wake up. Your best friend, your best friend, who was the last person you saw until you fell asleep for four million years, says, oh, yeah, you know what? We're not scientists anymore. Now we're warriors, <laughs> and it's way cooler. Trust me. Yeah. Okay, well, why wouldn't you trust me? He's your best friend. you know. And then suddenly your best friend hands you a gun and says, okay, now murder these guys. Right. And now you're like, okay, he's my best friend. Why would he lie to me? Why would he lead me astray? But I got this function. I'm a scientist. I'm not an executioner. And that is the tension that Skyfire walks in his first appearance. And it's so good. And I wish we had more episodes like that because it really highlights, I think, something as a child made these characters interesting to me or this whole, pro- this whole premise interesting to me is that they have a function and that function guides their choices, you know? Yeah. Would that we all had that. We don't. Mm-hmm. We're, we're much more dynamic than that. And we're going to talk about that when we get to the humans in a little bit. But mm-hmm. yeah, Skyfire is terrific. <laughs> so that just brings us to Optimus Prime. Commander. Hang on to your dreams, Chip. The future is built on dreams. Hang on. <laughs> Commander Optimus Prime. Yeah. I definitely had him. I had him fairly early on. I would say at least in the first year. Wow. Tell me what that was like. Tell me what that was like. I didn't. No, I'm serious. Because I, I didn't get my hands on an Optimus until probably like 86 or so. And it was wow. like doing another trade with a kid. So what was it like getting like that? Because he felt like a fairly sizable or at least a complex toy compared to anybody else at that time. Yeah. I mean, even though the, the trailer didn't get a lot of show in the cartoon, you know, it was it was neat to have that sort of play value because you had not just Roller, but you had the little gun guy in the back, whatever you call that part of mm-hmm. it. It was neat as a transformer because it looked perfect as a semi-truck. And then mm-hmm. it turned into this whole other thing. And, of course, that's all well, you say. Well, every Transformer does that, Hoover. But <laughs> not every Transformer looks great as a robot. I mean, just look at Braun, you know. Yeah, yeah. But Prime looks great as a robot. And, of course, you can see the truck parts on him. Yeah. But he still looks great in either mode. So he was fun to play with because of that. Because he had a lot of play value. He was great looking in either mode. You know, it was just it was just a, a home run on the design team's part. So by the time I got my hands on an Optimus toy, I mean, I knew what the toy looked like, but only through watching it on commercials. And so when I actually had it in my hands, I remember this is like 86 or so. At this time, I had decided that I wanted to be a comic book artist 
to, seriously enough that I decided it's time for me to start studying what masters are doing, right? Like, and I didn't know what that meant as a kid. I was like, <laughs> okay, well, Jim Starlin's stuff looks really great. I'm just going to copy that. George Perez's stuff looks really great. I'm just going to copy that. And so it was about this time that I started understanding like anatomy on people, or at least understanding there's different parts and there's different ways to draw the different things, right? So like two years before when I was doing He-Man fan art for my friends in class, I'm just doing like the thing kids do where I draw like bubbles for muscles. <laughs> like there's like six <laughs> bubbles going down his arm. He's muscular, you know? <laughs> but by 1986 or so, now I'm like, okay, there's a bicep and there's a tricep and maybe I don't know the names of them, but I'm at least understanding there's like different shapes of muscles for different parts of the body. And I remember looking at Optimus going like, Oh, they made the windows into his pectorals and the grill is his abdominals. And I remember thinking like <laughs> chef's kiss, toy designers. <laughs> like, I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have picked up on that in 84, but by 86 I was like, ah, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> so he's still a truck, but he looks like a muscle man when he's in robot mode. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, he's a fantastic character. You know, he's the noblest of them all. He's always got the right ideas and he's always modeling good behavior for the rest of the Autobots. Most, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time. There's that time I still am looking at him side-eyed when he said, <laughs> in front of human technology. Uh, those rockets are impressive for primitive human technology. Don't talk like that, Optimus. That's not what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you're whispering to your coworkers, don't talk like that. <laughs> And I mean, without that Peter Cullen performance, you know, it could have been just a bland leader one type. But I mean, Peter Cullen comes to this role and makes it his own. Yeah, yeah, he really does. There's something about his voice that has strength and warmth in it at the same time. Right. And yeah. I think I think that's important because as much as I love Optimus Primal and I love Gary Chalk's performance, it doesn't really have that quality that Peter Cullen's performance has. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he hit it, but he hit it to where it feels very kind, yet don't push me. Liam Neeson is like the only other actor I can think mm. of that has that quality in this voice, right? Mm. Like, if you push me, it's going to get bad, but it, my default position is loving, right? Yeah. He's probably a, one of the biggest reasons that the franchise found its, its legs that it did, right? The character... Mm -hmm the toy because i mean i remember also playing with the toy thinking like this is not just an action figure it's a play set you know yeah <laughs> like, i'm looking at the camera and saying this is like i'm just realizing this i'm like yeah that's what they meant when they made it and mm -hmm. you know that's that's why it's the most expensive one <laughs> so like it had that too right like when you get that figure you're already like you can put bumblebee and all the mini bots in the like the repair bays in his trailer that's exciting yeah, yeah. optimus more to say about him in the months to come yeah <laughs> so that's all of the autobots from season one so let's move on to the flesh creatures mm -hmm. so let's talk a bit about spark plug stego what's this and Toronto who's this is there anything you don't know about chip yeah let's talk about about spark plug <laughs> doing the laundry I think I feel like I sort of take the wheel every time humans come up on this podcast. So I am very curious. I want to lean back and listen to what Hoover makes of Sparkplug Witwicky. Well, to me, Sparkplug is really only just there because Spike is a minor. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't make sense if Spike was just hanging out on his own and didn't have a dad. <laughs> I mean, Sparkplug has been useful to the plot a couple times. I mean, I've worked these mines. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> I guess. And he accomplishes some stuff back at base with Wheeljack and Ratchet. Yeah. But other than that, he's, he's just sort of there. And that's fine. Mm. You know, I don't need my humans to outshine the rest of the robots in the show. Sadly, I think what interests me most about spark plug is that that's chris lotta doing the voice and mm -hmm. sadly that sort of overpowers his character and just makes me think well this is probably what chris lotta sounds like when he's just talking yeah. so that's kind of interesting to me yeah. you know because i love chris lotta so much from starscream and cobra commander but yeah. as far as a character spark plug is just sort of eh <laughs> and you could tell, like, as, as soon as they had reason enough to get rid of him, like, when season three comes, and it's like, okay, Spike's an adult now. We don't need yeah. his dad around. <laughs> That's true. And that kind of bums me out, now that you say that. I would love to see Grandpa Spark Plug. <laughs> Why didn't Daniel get to hang out with his grandpa? <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
I'm actually kind of upset about this. Because <laughs> Spark Plug is a great guy. I, I I love Spark Plug. I love that he his outfit is that he's got like this skin tight like sort of tank top. This like with like mm. a like a short sleeve brown shirt pulled over top of it, but he doesn't button it up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, I love that he's sort of like, a, to use an old timey term, he's a grease monkey. You know, he's yeah. He hangs out in the machine shop, and that's where he's most at ease. Right? He's not a front lines kind of guy. He sits in the back with Wheeljack, and I like that he's eager to learn how to work on transformers. You know, the first couple times, the first I want to say like six or seven episodes, he's all like, "Oh, wonderful! I'll ever get used to that." When they transform, you know, Stego, mm-hmm. what's this Tyranna? Who's it? I don't know, but like <laughs> by time we're fully into the season two he's he's making robots now he makes autobot spike you know he makes the the weird device that drains evil and recharges good (laughs) i like that he very quietly and gently models the fact that we are never done evolving if i had a thesis on this part of the series so far is that it feels like the humans really reinforce this idea that humans are dynamic and growing creatures always and because of that they improve the behavior and the uh, situation for their friends, the Autobots. And that's the value they provide. It's not just friendship. It's not just they're, they're weak and need to be defended. It's that, you know, Wheeljack shows that like, hey, I first meet you. You guys are alien machines. I don't know what to do about you. By Ultimate Doom, he's fixing Transformers. By Season 2, he's building Transformers, you know. And I feel like that's something that didn't really land on me as a child because I keep coming back to this idea of like, I like the fact that grown-ups the older Autobots, like, they know what to do. Well, Spark Plug's here to show you that, no, you never you never fully know. You're always changing. You're always growing. More so than, well, about the same as Spike, right? Like, Spike also, like, we starts out, and he's like, help, help, help. Because the Autobots stopped the Decepticons from stealing Earth's resources, the governments of the world have agreed to give Optimus Prime the energy he needs to revitalize Cybertron. Yeah. And by... This point of season one, it's like he's done with that. Now he's like, hey, Laserbeak, you suck. Let go of me. (laughs) Up yours, Laserbeak. What? (laughs) Spike, I thought you needed help. I'll I'll got it. I got it. Here's the (laughs) electromagnet. I'll fix this. You know? Yeah, as far as Spike goes, I mean, it definitely, they definitely show that he is a key player in this mix. You know, it's not just the robots getting him out of jams anymore. It's. You know, he's oftentimes coming up with the plan and Mm -hmm. he's shown that he's just as brave as any 20 foot tall robot. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I I don't dislike Spike at all. It's just, you know, it's just not, eh. you know, I'm I'm a Decepticon guy, so I don't, I'm not in love with him. Also, his character reeks of vehicle character, right? Like, from the start, you could tell, like, okay, this is the character that's there for us to all identify with as children, to imagine mm-hmm. ourselves in that world. And as and, and I think we've told the story before. Like, when I was in my late, like, like middle school years, like, so like 12, 13, 14, and that's meant 14 high school. But, like, in that range, like, I started to really have a, a big chip on my shoulder with Spike. And also, it's like, I didn't come to this thing to see myself in it. I wanted to role play through right. the characters. Yeah. However... At the same time, like I said, when I was 11, almost every day of that school year, I sat in the playground and daydreamed about being best friends with Bumblebee. So, like, <laughs> it worked. It, I mean, it gave me that that license to imagine that scenario because I saw it happening on the screen, right? Mm-hmm. But I can see how he would not be a lot of people's cup of tea. A lot of the later human characters, like, as they've iterated on it, right? Like, you look at Sari in Transformers Animated, it's like, she, you know, elicits lots of different responses. Miko from Transformers Prime, who I adore, like top to bottom, love Miko. But I know that when the show was airing, there was a lot of like people who didn't care for what she was bringing to the table. So I get it. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I think there's something really lovely about this, whether it was intentional or not, this idea that the humans have more value than just being something to protect. And, mm-hmm. and it's not... It's not as simple as, well, you can't do that. You're just a human. Whoa, he did it. Who knew, <laughs> you know? Right. It's never yeah. like that. Like, Optimus is like, hey, Spike, will you go on this mission? What? Yeah. Now, I don't need to ask what you think of Chip Chase. <laughs> no, you don't. if anyone has listened to this show, <laughs> I'll, I'm going to keep my mouth know. shut. An Autobot? Prowl? 
This is Chip Chase. Don't worry. I'm assuming control now. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I like him a little bit more than Spike. He's interesting in that he seems to be, I guess just because he's sort of portrayed as a real brain, he seems to be a bit more useful than Spike mm-hmm. is in general. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like that about him. He's at top secret clearance for crying out loud. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He's just sort of there. I I like him enough. I don't I don't hate him or anything. You know, he's portrayed as really brave. That's great. I think that you think he's a good role model for a differently abled person, especially for the time. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. And they I think an interesting thing about him is that he's a brain and he's square. But he doesn't come up against any friction for that. I think Mm -hmm. that's an important thing to underline. I forget where I was listening to this discussion, but somebody was talking about how, like, you know, Revenge of the Nerds was, like, the beginning of, like, nerd culture becoming, like, I wouldn't say mainstream, but, like, uh, more accepted and less of a thing. Like, when we were kids, loving Garbage Pail Kids was a punchable offense, right? (laughs) Like... Like, if you're in eighth grade and you're still collecting Garbage Pail Kids, I remember very specifically kids, like, like threatening me over it. I'm like, why, why are you threatening me? Because I have Garbage Pail Kids in my locker. <laughs> like, really? You know, like, you're going to use violence because I collect stickers that you don't like? It's <laughs> fine, you know? But, like, Revenge of the Nerds was, like, the first, like, push back against it. And then, like, it turns into, like, it gets more, like, it's, like real genius, you know, like, mm. uh, with Val Kilmer. And, and then time goes on, and now we're in this period where, quote unquote geek culture is much more mainstream and accepted i'm not making a value judgment on that it's fine people get to choose things that they want to do it has no bearing on what my choices are or what i like right (laughs) but it's interesting that chip chase came along before this and you would think that there would be some moment in the story where chip gets made fun of for that right you would Mm -hmm. think there'd be something where his nerdiness would be pointed out as like that also makes him feel separate and apart and it's got something to be kind of ridiculed a little bit but no he's just portrayed as being very earnest and very smart and the world accepts him and i think that that i don't know how intentional that was but it's an interesting thing to model in a children's show now there's problematic stuff in that he's also developing weapons with the government (laughs) (laughs) like chip how can you be so good yet do that i get it we're at war with these evil machine robots i don't know what i would do in that scenario so i guess i can't judge you too harshly but it's like surely there's better ways to do it and that's when we get to the core which we just did where i'm like oh that's like the perfect encapsulation of the difficulty of a character like chip chase who walks that line between being you know government contract hire let's build some killing things and let's also like try to reconcile humanity with this alien species. So I'm sorry. I thought I was going to talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we better move on while we can. Yes. Carly. I saw you come in with that cute Autobot. Could you introduce me to him? Yeah. Uh, Carly was a big surprise for me because I didn't have really any thoughts of her growing up. It's just like, whatever. She's the girl. That's fine. You know, yep. whatever. But in the rewatch, I'm like, wow, boy, is she competent. Yeah. She is not only probably more competent than Spike and Sparkplug combined, yeah. but the girl goes to the Decepticon headquarters yeah. and plants a bomb. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious to me. <laughs> She's just some random girl that Spike meets and she, you know, gets swept up into this war and she's like you know what i'm gonna plant a bomb at the septicon headquarters well meeting bumblebee will do that to you but <laughs> but it, it you're right like it's it's also and i think we talked about this in the immobilizer is they never draw any attention to that so really i do have to applaud the writers of the first season and first season and a half because a they didn't bring any attention to the fact that chip was a nerd in any kind of like predictable way whatever mm-hmm. nerd you know Everybody admires him. Even Sparkplug's like, what, Stega Who's it? Is anything you don't know, Chip? You know, yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of ribbing him, but it's also showing admiration. You know, Carly shows up it, it, at that time. At that time, there were so many stories on television where it's like, you can't do that. You're a girl. What? She did it. <laughs> Spaceballs for crying out loud, right? Like when uh, Daphne Zuniga's character mows down all those, those bad guys with the laser gun, they're like, whoa, that's not bad for a girl. You know, <laughs> I, that was part of like the the natural cultural dialogue at the time. Carly shows up, does all this awesome stuff. Never once do they bring any attention 
to her sex or gender, right? Mm-hmm. It's just yeah. like, she, she's just a, a human, and humans do really impressive things. And yeah, you're right. Spike's been to Decepticon headquarters a couple of times, always with a whole bunch of Autobots. Carly's like, yeah, I'm going to take this boat. <laughs> Where are you going? I'm going to go plant a bomb on Decepticon headquarters. What? <laughs> Yeah, so I look forward to seeing more of her in season two. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's right. She she does show up a little bit more in season two. I'm excited about that. Mm-hmm. A couple more times. A little bit of a drag when she shows up in season three, as far as my memory goes, but we'll see. Yeah. But oh, basically, yeah. that's everybody in season one and the first part of season two before they introduce all these other new characters. Now we're going to get at least 16 more Autobots coming in season (laughs) two. And those are just the ones with the toys. They're going to introduce some that don't have toys as well. So now you can probably see why we would want to do an episode like this, because the people are going to be coming fast and furious right away. So, yeah. I have a feeling we're going to need to do a season two wrap up where we recount all the new characters we meet because you're right. <laughs> because season three is going to do the same thing. It's going to like, yeah. Be like, yeah, you like those guys. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. No more Lord Gaikany. No more Lord Gaikany. <laughs> oh, Cause well, no, that's what I was driving at is like you, you point out 16 characters that we get toys based on. There's a lot more beyond that, that gets added mm-hmm. to the mythology in terms of general world building characters. And then characters who walk in and out of like one or two episodes never to be seen again. So yeah. Well, goodness. Okay. So, so next week we will do this very same thing. Only we will talk about the Decepticons mm. and, so the next time you'll have to shut me up and keep me to under three to four minutes to talk about each character. But Lord knows I've done it enough in previous episodes to where you guys know. Yeah, everybody knows. And I, I have a feeling that they will not get tired of it the way I have not gotten tired of it over 25 years <laughs> of talking about this stuff. I One of my favorite things is just saying, like, Hooper, tell me about Reflector. Go. And then I sit down. I rather It's I go just into like the... white noise in terms of he just drifts off to sleep. Yeah, well, I was I was actually going to paint a, a more flattering picture of me going to the kitchen, pouring myself a highball, sitting down comfortably, <laughs> getting cozy in my wing back chair, and like leaning back and closing my eyes and just letting it flow over me. Hoover's passion for this character who turns into three people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that'll be next time here on Four Million Years Later. So okay. we'll see you then. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4millionyearslater.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Hoover. Okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com, and if you haven't yet, Please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>